Welcome, everybody. My name is Ken Seaton, co-founder of Athletes Touch with Justin Blaine. Welcome to the Tower of Power podcast that we've got coming at you right now. We're an exclusive community helping former pro and college athletes in the business world get ready to rocket fuel your ship, professionally speaking. I'm here. Justin, go ahead and take it away. If you like great stories, sports, and success, you're in the right place. Buckle up and join us for a great ride. Today, we're going to hear from Jeff Levin. An amazing sports broadcaster who works for the Brewers organization. He's got an amazing story coming from Chapman Baseball to now working side by side with Bob Uecker, one of the true legends. We're excited to hear about his little tidbits. He's got some great stuff for us. Thank, thanks so much for coming on and, and thanks, thanks so much for being positive throughout this whole thing. So you, we appreciate that. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, you know, obviously, you know, where you grew up, you know, how you came up through the baseball ranks, and then we'll kind of get into some more, like, substantive questions and all that. Um, yeah, obviously, I'm not a dance uh, instructor of any sort, um, so that, I'll just start it off with that. Um, my wife and I just have a lot of fun, and we clearly have two young children, that five and two years old. You might have saw me leave in the middle of it, and... Um, you know, code red tantrum at the moment for a five-year-old. He's, he's not in school. It's really tough and trying to balance all that, which I'm sure a lot of you have to deal with too. Uh, but we're just trying to keep everything positive and, and uh, put some smiles on some people's faces during all this craziness and uncertainty. Uh, so I grew up in Sacramento, California, uh, born and raised there. My folks still live there, um, played baseball ever since I could pick one up at the age of four. Uh, played high school ball. I uh, was one of, one of the best teams in the state my senior year. J.P. Howell, who pitched for the Dodgers, the Rays, uh, Toronto Blue Jays, among some other teams, was, was our ace of that staff. Uh, went to Chatham University, as Chad mentioned, and Mike was there. We won a national title in 03, finished as the uh, fourth place team in 2005. And at that time, my senior year, I was at kind of a crossroads in my career and my life where you're graduating, you're trying to make a transition at 5'10 as a DH and coming off the bench and not playing a position. I wasn't playing professionally. I kind of knew that. The writing was on the wall. And I got into broadcasting. At that point, I was working and in, in interning at Fox. So I would, I would be working on that. And occasionally some producers would need me to fill in for Angels games or whatever. That's kind of how I got my start. So when I graduated, baseball was over, school was over, internship was over, but I just kept showing up. They didn't tell me to stop coming into work. So it turned into a full-time job. And I worked seven days a week, started working for the Angels full-time, graduated to an associate producer come the fall in all the Olympic sports as well as the big sports. Lo and behold, the summer of 2006, I got a call from one of my former classmates in college who was the public address announcer for the Quakes in Rancho Cucamonga. And he said, hey, listen, we're starting to do some Saturday TV games. Would you want to fill in? I got a call on midnight. Uh, on a Friday night going into a Saturday game they said hey listen we don't know who you are we've never heard you call a game I'd never called a baseball game in my life they said but we're kind of in a pinch can you be here tomorrow at three yeah sure why not so 2006 I called my first game ever it was terrifying I was scared the entire the entire way I'd never heard of half of these players I apparently did well enough that they invited me to come back a couple of weeks later I ended up filling in for six games that year that summer their regular play-by-play -play guy left Heading into the 2007 season, the assistant general manager at the time, you talk about how connections are everything in this industry. The assistant general manager ended up playing for the same college coach that recruited me to go to Chapman. This guy, my assistant general manager, played for him at UC Davis. He calls him up and says, this guy okay? Or He said, yeah, he's going to be fine. So that's how I got hired, basically. It wasn't because I was good. It wasn't, I was just happened to be in the right spot at the right time with the right people. And I became the director of broadcasting and media relations. And my first day on the job, which was January 5th, 2007, they said, hey, welcome to the club. We don't have a radio station. Good luck. <laughs> so, boom, there it was. And I was negotiating radio deals and selling corporate sponsorships and season tickets. And then that year, about the halfway point is when Chris joined the team. And, and he mentions how his dad used to listen to our, our broadcast. I think his dad and his mom were the only ones that did listen to our broadcast, which was good. I was really, really lucky in that aspect because I could make so many mistakes and nobody was going to hear it. So I, I had that springboard to, to find myself and find my voice and, and my broadcast style. That, that's when it started in 2007. It was three years there uh, with the Cardinals organization after that. And then I spent two years in AAA with the Pawtucket Red Sox in Rhode Island. 
Uh, I was there for two years before I got my job in the big leagues. And this would have been my sixth season in Milwaukee. Who knows? It might still be. We just don't know when we're coming back. Uh, again, that's the baseball side. I've been doing college basketball for the last six years, too, on Fox. So that, that's kind of a truncated version of, of how I got to where I am. And That's awesome, Jeff. Thank you for that. Um, there's something special about baseball and, and radio broadcasting. Can you try to put your finger on what is it exactly? And who it, who were you listening to on radio when you were a kid growing up? So when I grew up, uh, again, being in, in Northern California, grew up a Giants fan, and uh, John Miller got there, mid-90s. Hank Greenwald was there before. Lon Simmons a little bit um, mixed in there, too. So those are the guys that I grew up listening to, and I, I think there's something so nostalgic about listening to baseball on the radio. For me, it reminds me of my dad working in the backyard or sitting out there shooting hoops or, or simulating games out in the front yard with him pitching to me, me hitting line drives right back at his ankles all the time. But you're, you're listening to games, and, and it brings you back to, to my childhood of making up stories. And, and for me, being on the radio side, that, that's all it is. And um, you, you don't – the fan and the listener doesn't know what they're listening to until you tell them. We can make something sound so much better than it really is, just by the way that we describe it. But you can make a ground ball to short sound – way more exciting than than just a routine ground ball to short and that's what's fun about the radio side is that you can be super creative and you can tell stories and and you can get a little fun with with things when in during blowouts that, that's so cool and i want to talk about you know you being in the booth so to speak with bob and and what that feels like what it felt like the first time that you were in there what what was that like for you so it's it's um it's a really tough place to be when when you're sitting next to to royalty as, as it is, right? So he's, he's been the only guy that, that I know that has been able to mold being a professional athlete, turning that into a stand-up comedy routine, and then getting onto the Johnny Carson show almost 100 times, and then turning that into a play-by-play -play job, which he had never done before in his life. He just messed around with it in the, in the bullpens and, and made fun of himself. And he talks about the first time that he ever went on the air. His crutch was that he only worked for, for an inning at times as a color commentator. He never did play-by-play. -play. And then at Yankee Stadium in 1971, him and his partners, he was taken over for the fifth inning. And they said, all right, here's Bob with the play-by-play. -play. And his two partners got up, and they left the room. And he was all by himself. And he was silent for the first couple of outs. And finally, his producer goes, um, hey, Bob, you're on. You might, you might want to talk. I mean, you're the person who's describing this game. You got to go. And, and that was kind of his – he had to get over his fears. He had to get over talking, and, and that was a, a big part. So when I made my major league debut in May of 2015, I wasn't working with Bob. I was working with another guy because I was the third man in the booth, and I worked the road games. So when he tossed it to me for my first inning of play-by-play -play in the big leagues, Comerica Park in Detroit, he says, all right, for the play-by-play, -play, here's Jeff. He put his headset down. He left the room. And I went, well, this is no big deal. I've done games all by myself. It just happens to be a three-tiered ballpark, and it's big leaguers. And, oh, hey, here's Ryan Braun. And in that first inning that I ever called, the Brewers hit back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs. And I'm sitting there by myself going, holy shit, I'm in the big leagues. This is life now. So you, you learn trial by fire. But, but working with Bob and, and being that big personality that he is, the first thing – for me was learning to shut up. Just don't talk. Make, make, if he brings you into the conversation, he brings you into the conversation. But don't try and, and outshine him because you never will. And you're going to end up looking bad. That was one of the things that I had to learn working with him was how many different layers that he can go into different stories. How deep does he want to go with this story? That's my job to navigate how much more do I want to pull out of this story. So that was a big thing to learn from him. Um, and, it, and it works a little bit in, in the business world, too. You guys were talking about having your 30-second stories, your minute stories, your two-minute stories. Well, with Bob, it's, okay, what's his attitude like today? How much does he want to share? How deep does he want to get? It's, it's really about feeling the room with him um, and, and how deep he wants to go with certain situations. Well, you, you've touched on a topic that we feel pretty passionate about here, which is storytelling, right, at, at its finest. What kind of, what do you look at in a story, if you will? I mean, this is more for everybody on the call. What, you know, what's a great story? How do you do your research? How much research are you doing? Those kinds of things. Well, I always go into every broadcast thinking that it's going to be a four and a half hour game and hoping it's a two hour game. And I don't have to use three quarters of the stuff that I research. But 
but for me, it, the way that I broadcast, and it, it's different on the radio side as it is on the television side, whereas on TV, you're, you're just kind of highlighting what is already a beautiful picture that you can see. So I, I don't really have to do a lot of describing when I'm on TV. When I'm on the radio, it's a, it's a balance of, of three S's. And I, again, this, this is something I write down on every single score sheet that I ever do. I have it on a sticky note on my desk every single time, three S's, silence, stats, and stories. And it's a balance, like you've got like uh, the Red Panda. You guys ever seen Red Panda perform at a halftime show? She's the one that spins all the plates on the, 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 uh, on the sticks and then she's yeah. flipping cups up and she'll catch the cups. Right, so you, you see the juggling act where you've got all the plates, you're trying to balance them. And it's the silence, the storytelling, and the stats. If you feel like you're being too quiet, maybe tell a story. If you're telling too many stories, maybe fill in a couple of stats. If you're too stats heavy, maybe go back to the story or just shut up for a little while. Um, it, it's that balancing act of, of trying to, to find the right feel and, and feel out the game too. So for the stories that I like telling, I, for me, it's more getting on the personal side. And, and Chris will attest to this too, that I like spend a lot of time down on the, on the field before games, during batting practice, because um, that's when you're going to get your best stuff. And I, I just like to post up and sit on the, the top of the cage when guys are hitting and watch them hit because I, I know what these guys are trying to do. I can see what they're trying to, to work on with their swings and what their hands and what their, their bat path is doing and what their legs are doing and working with hitting coaches and things of that nature. I like watching bullpens. And, and those, are, those are times when you can talk to a bullpen coach or a pitching coach or as players come behind you in the cage to, to take their turn. It's, it's how's your family doing? What's going on? Who's in town to come visit you? We're on a road trip. Where do you like going to eat? What do you like doing? What was your high school experience like? Who was the high school coach that taught you the most? It's those types of things that happen organically that I'm not necessarily fishing for. But it's just you're sitting there on the top step of the dugout or you're sitting there by the batting cage and things just happen organically and you find out about people. And, and, and more importantly, you gain that trust with people that if they tell you something, you're not automatically just going to go spill your guts on the air you hold some of that stuff and, and you don't even say three quarters of the things you guys talk about. You can you ask them, Hey, is this something that I can talk about? Or, Hey, you're working on this. Should I talk about that or should I not? Um, and it's gaining that trust over the course of time. And, and it was a lot easier in the minor leagues when you had all the access uh, in the big leagues, guys are a little bit more reserved. They, they've got their routines, uh, but you can, there, there are people in the clubhouse where they're, they're more, down to earth people and, and you can get to the core of who those people are. Those are the types of stories that I like, the personal interest stories. I, I dig as deep as I can and if there's research on it, it I like getting more from, from the players themselves more than anything else. Talk about the, uh, the silence. Uh, I have assumption what it is, but I'd love to hear it from, from you. What, what does that mean, silence? The game says a lot. So in, in big moments, you think about the Dodgers in 88 against Eckersley and Vince Scully's call. And he says, she is gone. And then it's, he doesn't say a word for like 45 seconds. And he lets the pictures tell the story. And you can do that on television. You can do it to an extent on radio too. Um, one of my biggest calls ever was game one of the division series in 2018, Brewers and Rockies. Game goes into extra innings. Brewers blew the lead in the ninth. And I'm on in the 10th. And I even told, I asked Bob first, I said, hey, listen, this is game one of the division series. It usually when we switch off, he gets the ninth. And if we go extra innings, I get the 10th and the 11th. And going into the 10th, I said, hey, Bob, do you want this? Do you want this call? And he goes, no, man, go ahead. You got it. You got it. You got it. I'm like, okay, this is, this is going to be my call. So in the bottom of the 10th inning, Mike Moustakis gets a base hit to win the game. I describe what happens, base hit to right, winning run, Brewers take game one. And I just didn't talk. The crowd was going crazy. And as a fan, sometimes you just want to hear the crowd. You just want to hear, you want to feel like you're there. And if you're in the backyard grilling a steak or a sausage or whatever you're doing, uh, sipping on a beer, playing catch, you can tell a lot by what the crowd is doing. Whenever we go to Dodger Stadium, I find myself being a lot more quiet, first and foremost, because I can't hear anything that's going on because of the damn speakers in center field. Those things are blaring at you all the time. So I'm just trying to, to shut up as much as possible because I can't think and I don't know what I'm saying. Um, but, the, but the sounds that you get from the ballpark, especially Dodger Stadium, are really special. 
um, and you can and you can be quiet, and you can get away with it. Now, in 2007, in Rancho Cucamonga, when we go to Bakersfield, and there are seven people in the crowd, and Peter Borges comes up to you after the ball game and says, "Hey, man, you called a good one because you can hear me in center. You can't really have a lot of silence because you're going to get everything." Um, but at the same time, it's it's feeling the situation. It's 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 tempering what's happening during the game, and and you can say a lot by not saying anything at all. That's awesome. Yeah, really, uh, really good stuff. Welcome to the intermission. Kent, who's this group for? Is it for Super Bowl champs? Check. How about cross-country skiers? Check. How about Olympic synchronized swimmers? Triple check. So it sounds like anybody who has an athlete's mindset or mentality could qualify here. Quadruple check, Justin. This group is a rocket fuel power community for former athletes to use their state of mind to succeed in the sport of business. And then the stats, obviously, some people provide, but you probably do some of your own research. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all on my own on the radio side. I don't have stats guy. It's all on me. And, wow. and the best part about what I do working with Bob is, is that he's such a great storyteller that I, I don't really dive too much into stats because I don't really know where he's going to go. It's tough to have a game plan on a broadcast when you're working with Bob because he could, you could be talking about something and, A, he might not understand what you're trying to say and he goes in a different direction. So you just pivot and you go with it. Um, so my stats, like a lot of people are talking about all the saber metrics and war and FIP and all these different acronyms. I'm going, I, if I'm, if I start talking about that stuff on a radio broadcast and you're listening to it while driving your car, you're going to drive your car into a bridge embankment because you're just, your brain's going to explode because it, it's really, it's more of a medium for a television graphic, right? I like looking at something I could say, okay, this is going to be this, this means this. And because his war means this and it matches up with this person, okay, I get that because I'm looking at it. But if I'm trying to describe that, I'm going to miss pitches, I'm going to miss action, and I'm going to make people's heads explode while they're driving. And nobody needs that. Um, so it's, it's a, a time and a place for stats. It's more batting average. What's he done in these situations? What has he done lifetime against pitcher XYZ? That's, that, those are the, the meat stats that I use mostly. So dive in a little more storytelling. Who, who's, who's your fave uh, on the Brewers right now, you know, and, and why is he so near and dear to you? Maybe just a story or two about it. Well, I mean, Christian Yelich is pretty damn good. I mean, he's, he's awesome. I love what he's been able to do recently. I got a, a text message from the, the commissioner of the CIF the other day. He used to be the athletic director of my high school. Um, and you guys probably saw it, the letter that Christian Yelich wrote to his high school coach. Um, and it just goes to show what a good dude he is. He, he talks about playing catch with his brother in the street. I mean, they're like 10 year old kids again. And I think that's great. Um, he's a really down to earth guy and granted, Hey, everybody wants to be the MVP. Everybody wants to be the best player in baseball, but for Yelich, he could have won it last year. I know Bellinger won. He had a great season. Uh, Yelich could have won it had he not got hurt and missed the last three weeks of the season. But I, I can guarantee you that this offseason going into 2020, he actually had a chance to take a break and take a breath. And he wasn't on that celebrity tour that he was on. He wasn't being a guest on Magnum PI and flying to Hawaii. And granted, there's some great benefits to being the MVP, but there's a lot of benefits to just sitting around and getting your work done, too. And it speaks to a lot about what Christian Yelich is all about. So he's a guy, obviously, that I like gravitating towards. Um, Eric Sogard is another one who's back with the Brewers. He played at Arizona State. Um, he was with Brewers a couple of years ago. He's bounced around. But just a, a hard-nosed player who doesn't take any crap from anybody. And he's, he's smaller in stature. He wears glasses when he plays. He's just a good down-to-earth guy. And, um, and a player that the Brewers just got this year, signed a free agent contract. Uh, Brock Holt, who I had in Pawtucket as a minor league player and got to know him really well in my two years in Pawtucket. Uh, Brock Holt is a great guy. My son's name is Brock and Brock Holt thinks that I named my kid after him. <laughs> so it's a great story that, that we get to go back and forth with. Um, they got to meet in spring training this year. I brought my son to the ballpark and, and saw Brock Holt for the first time. And Brock comes over to my son and goes, Hey, I heard your name's Brock. You're named after me. Right. And, and my son being, this is 
says his name to a T goes, no, I think you're named after me, actually. <laughs> I went, oh, my God, only a five-year-old would get away with that and, and make it sound cool to big league players. So uh, those, are, those are three guys that I really like being around. Brandon Woodruff's another guy. He's just a down-to-earth Alabama kid and throws 100 miles an hour, and you'd never know the difference. Josh Hader's the same. Um, some, some really good personalities on our roster. Yeah, no, some legendary stuff uh, that's going on. And, and I've, I've got a couple more questions, but some of us have never been to a Brewer game, right? I've never seen the stadium. We don't know the vibe over there. You know, we're L.A. people, a lot of us, Orange County. What's it like to be a fan? It, there's something about the Midwest. If you've never been to the Midwest, whether upper Midwest, all the way down, it, it's just a totally different vibe, and, and they hold you to a different standard. Here in Milwaukee – they look forward to springtime. They look forward to the good weather. They look forward to tailgating. And one of the reasons they built the ballpark where they did was so that they could have tailgating. Like that doesn't exist in other places. One of my favorite things ever is opening day at Miller Park at six o'clock in the morning. There are people lined up to get into the ballpark. The highway is jammed up and there are people with their tailgates open and they're grilling on the side of the highway. That's Brewers baseball to a T. It's a great atmosphere. They don't boo you. It's just a, a really good place to be and enjoy being outside. I, I'm telling you, in the spring and the summer here in the state of Wisconsin, that's what everybody's doing when the sun is out here in Wisconsin. And it could be 50 degrees. It could be 30 degrees. But if the sun is out, people are outside getting stuff done. That, that's awesome. All right, we're going we're gonna to open this up. Justin, you had a question? Yeah, Jeff, thank you for sharing. I, I love hearing the, the baseball stories. How do you see the difference from, from your vantage point, trying to connect with, with guys, get them to trust you, build relationships? How do you, or even in front office, how do you see the differences between California guys, international guys, high school versus college? How do you see it from kind of your lens? I, I learned a really big lesson when I got to the big leagues to where, again, in the minor leagues, you're, you're the media relations guy. You're the person going to the manager and getting roster transactions. Um, you're the point person on the road. For me, I, I picked out all the movies on the minor leagues for us to watch. In the, but when I got to the big leagues, uh, Brian Anderson, who does our television broadcast for the Brewers, does national games for Turner, he, he taught me a really good lesson. He said, hey, listen, whenever you're at the ballpark, make sure that, that you're seen and not heard. That was a really, a really big lesson for me. If someone wants to engage you in a conversation, you can engage in that conversation. But don't, don't go up to people with an agenda. You might have something that you want to ask them, but it, for me, it has to come up organically. You know, unless it's a, a hey, listen, I'm working on a story and I got to ask you one question. It's about this. I like more of, of having organic conversations, but you can, you can understand what players you're going to get and, and their types of personalities within about five minutes of meeting them. Thanks. That's a great story. Thank you to Jeff for coming out. Thanks for the opportunity to chat with you guys. Another great story in the books. Who's inspired with me? Kent, where do people go from here? God, Justin, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Everybody today, we're so excited to have you on this show. If you're interested in our Rocket Fuel Accelerator, if you'd like to join membership at Athletes Touch, go to our awesome website at www.athletestouch.co. And we'll see you soon. If you want to look us up on our social handles, LinkedIn, and Twitter, Athletes Touch, at Athletes Touch. Thanks, guys.